Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode 111. He stay Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here on this Monday, Dave. I know we are a football Steelers show, but we just mentioned it uh, before we got on the podcast. I'm not a big wrestling guy. I didn't purchase WrestleMania uh, last night, but that looked like a lot of fun. Pat McAfee did a heck of a job as, as his debut in the ring. Yeah, he, uh, he 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 really did. It was very entertaining. Now the end of end of it, the last match, you know, uh, uh, really left a lot to be desired there. And uh, but uh, nothing else going. Look, the timing of that uh, of them having that was probably absolutely perfect because right slam uh, slack. Um, in the, in the middle of uh, what all the final four madness and and obviously yesterday afternoon I think was the uh, uh, ladies final uh, final game with UConn and all and boy South Carolina that that team was uh, I don't know if you watched any of that game but uh, and I I'm I'm kind of kind of a closet uh, uh, ladies UConn fan I just like Gino uh, Ariyama you know the, mm-hmm. the head coach for that team and all like that so I had that going in the background yesterday but uh, uh, yeah McAfee boy he sold that uh, Stone Cold stunner uh, uh <laughs> real well with the beer coming out of his spraying out of his mouth and uh laying on the uh uh, laying on the floor there with uh, pouring the beer in his mouth off. Very, very entertaining. So uh, uh, I don't know how much further he's going to try to take, you know, take it uh, in his career, but I, uh, you know, obviously he's a, a super popular guy right now. I think we've talked about his shows several times and, and how kind of different it is and, and new age and, and really uh, right. What, you know, probably needs to be uh, at this age uh, uh, of media and, and especially sports radio, I guess. But uh, yeah, good for him. That that came off real well for his match last night. And you're as Jack as Vince McMahon is at 76, right? That dude is still ripped. My goodness. Lord have mercy. That guy still put together at, at, at his age. Yeah. Uh, uh, and people quite- were mad about how he sold the stunner. Dude, 76. <laughs> he's like, he's getting the stunner at all. Like, just credit, uh, give him some credit. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It looked like it was a little bit of a slip between him, you know. Uh, Stone Cold kind of reached out for him at first and then kind of missed him. And then uh, McMahon went into the ropes and, you know, kind of bounced back at him and all like that. Yeah, he didn't sell it as, near as good, obviously, as Pat McAfee did. Yeah, but I think we'll give the guy a little bit yeah. of slack. But let's go back to Pittsburgh here. Um, obviously, a quieter weekend, as as you mentioned today, free agency is kind of really slowed down to a crawl here. Um, so just a couple of things to hit on in terms of the news aspect of things. Do want to mention the Steelers, the NFL announced the offseason workout dates for all teams. Some offseason programs beginning today for teams with new head coaches like Miami and other clubs for Pittsburgh. Their offseason program can begin on April 18th, so 14 days from now. The OTA and minicamp schedule has also been released. Pittsburgh will have their OTAs May 24th through the 26th, the 31st through June 2nd, June 6th through June 9th. And the three-day mandatory minicamp will be held June 14th through the 16th. No official date on the rookie minicamp. That will take place a week or two after the NFL draft. Yeah, and uh, if, if you look at the calendar, the way the students normally do things after the draft, and uh, especially with the rookie minicamp there, I, I would suspect that we're looking at probably, what, the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th. I would, I would probably expect those dates to be. I would imagine – uh, uh, it won't be too terribly long before the students actually set that in stone there. But uh, uh, generally, they don't have it the first weekend uh, right after the draft. Normally, it's the second weekend, and then that would put put that uh, uh, right in line for you know, for, for their rookie minicamp at all. But uh, yeah, starting to get some football dates on the calendar now. And, you know, we say it all the time, man, the NFL does a great job of being able to move their move their calendar along. Uh, it, for the first time, really, this offseason, it feels like there's a lag in 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 in, in the news cycle right now. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and who knows? You know, free agency is is slowed to kind of a uh, a real slow drip at this point. I mean, there's still a lot of 
you know, kind of notable names out there, if you will. And I, I, you know, several of these guys are kind of street free agents. And then the others that are, that are uh, regular, you know, unrestricted free agents. I don't know. Maybe some teams are thinking that they'll put the, some deals together for some of these guys and then execute them, you know, after the, the official ending of, uh, uh, of free agency there right after the draft there to kind of, I guess, avoid the, the compensatory formula there. But, uh, you know, a guy like uh, Terrell Edmonds, you know, uh, I would think that by the end of this week, we would know something with him. If we don't find out some news on Terrell Edmonds by the end of this week, then there's probably a good bet that he's going to be one of those guys that's lined up to be signed after the draft to kind of avoid the uh, the compensatory formula, uh, if you will. But uh, still have guys like, you know, Tyron Matthew out there and, you know, Jarvis Landry, uh, although he's a street free agent, so it really doesn't matter when you sign him. Uh, he's out there. But, you know, for the most part, this thing has really, really crawled uh, to a slow drip. Yeah, it has. And I know that Tyron Matthew tweeted at somebody the other day um, that don't expect him to sign anytime soon. I'm trying to find the exact tweet that he had uh, sent out. I can't find it off the top of my head right now, but it, it might be a little while for him as he continues to weigh options. And is that the shoe that needs to drop before the other safeties like Edmund sign? I'm not sure, but according to Matthew, it may be a little bit. At least he's in no no hurry to get signed. Yeah, that might be uh, that, that might be the case as well, too. You know, uh, I if, if it was considerable money, I would think at this point he would have signed, though, you know, uh, but, you know, maybe he's still weighing his off. Who knows? There's, you know, with, with the way the Twitter cycle sure. is now uh, every five, you know, for for a period of time, there's like every five minutes, there's a different report on, on Tyron Matthew. Oh, he's fixing to sign with the Raiders. Or he's, you know, and none of it has happened yet. So, yeah. Uh, Generally, though, I think when you get into like this, the beginning of the, I guess this would be the beginning of the fourth week of the, of the new league year. Uh, you usually see a little bit more action there in, in that week. And then if whatever doesn't happen this week usually gets prolonged, prolonged until after the draft. Uh, those kind of things there. So uh, I don't know. I, I have a feeling I don't know about Matt, uh, Tyron Matthew specifically, but I would think that. I just got a feeling that we'll know more about uh, Terrell Evans Evans mm -hmm. by, by, by the time Friday rolls around. Yeah, that's possible. I will admit I'm somebody that gets extreme cold feet. And the fact we're sitting here first week of April without any knowledge of who the starting strong safety is and really who the starting slot receiver is has me a little uncomfortable, but I understand these things will take time and there's not, they're not playing football for several more months. Isn't Tavon Young still uh, unsigned as well too? Yes. Man, what a what a you know if you could get him for a song, how nice would that be to put him in there? Uh, you know, with, with not having the financial risk involved, and that would be a great fit, I think, for the Steelers if you could get him mm -hmm. uh, signed to. But once again, you know, if, if you're dealing with a player that's you know coming in around the three or four million dollar mark, and I have no idea if that's where he's at. Uh, uh, you know, might be a little bit less than that, but you know, the Steelers aren't going to give those one year contracts out like that. They'll try to get the player on a two year deal. Uh, if he's going to have an average yearly value, say of around, I don't know, three and a quarter or uh, a million or more. So, uh, but I mean, he would be a nice, uh, at least just, he's had the injury history and all, but I think he was able to play last year and, right. you know, he's obviously he's on the backside of his career. So I think expectations with a guy like Tavon Young, shouldn't be you know off the chart but i think you know if you got it for the right price it, it really reduces the risk and you play him uh you obviously you, you're still able to draft for for that position and all like that and if things don't go well with him out of shoot then you you'll obviously get your your younger your younger talent infused in there but uh uh he would be a guy jarvis lander is a guy i think we've talked about a few times if you could get him for the right price on a two-year deal on his age would obviously be a fit uh, outside of that, though, I think you're really, really running out of mm -hmm. uh, out of options. I think we're both kind of uh, resigned to the fact that they're probably done with the offensive line at this point. Uh, I mean, they could use another running back in that room right now at this point for sure. Uh, you know, they haven't re-signed Bellage yet. Even if they do resign, did resign Belage, it would be on a uh, on a veteran benefit contract, so you wouldn't have anything really invested uh, there. But uh, 
you know, it'd be interesting to see some of these other veteran running backs still unsigned that are around that at least can maybe give you a little something on special teams to see if, if, if the train starts moving in that area as well, too, because let's face it. I mean, the Steelers don't have a backup running back right now, right? Yeah. And to me, that's a concern. I think it'll be tough to convince a free agent to come here to spend the money on that and then have a guy who wants to come here knowing he's going to be the clear number two, not even committee, but clear backup. I think the draft undrafted free agent late day three picks uh the better way to go i know deshaun elliott is still out there that's been a guy that's been on my radar since before uh, the new league year began with Tavon young you would envision that still as that slot corner kind of role. yeah yeah abs- would, abs- okay. absolutely yes yeah um yeah he played 17 games last year showed he was healthy and so that's really important i'm sure is you know i'm sure he's pretty cost effective but um teams may be wanting to, to wait on that as well right and once again i wouldn't you know i wouldn't invest a lot of money in a guy like him but uh uh, you know, if you, if you, if you can have them on the cheap, I think, I think there's some upside to be had in, in the risk or reward factor, uh, specifically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like him coming out of temple, like a really, he was an outside corner at temple as a small guy and played well. And they tried him an outside corner in Baltimore and he's been more slot lately and had a lot of injuries, barely played, you know, the, the previous two years prior to 2021, but there's, there's always been talent there with Dave Young. Uh, all right, Dave, Art Rooney speaking with Sirius Radio earlier, really it was last week, I guess it was, um, about some of the rule changes, OT type of things, a little bit of uh, time spent on the current Pittsburgh Steelers roster and was asked about the quarterback competition. Obviously, one of the biggest you know, questions with this team, what will happen, a quarterback who will be this team's week one starter and gave a pretty standard answer, but one still worth passing on talking about the signing of Mitch Trubisky. Rooney said, quote, People know that Mitch have great things to say about him. He came in and just the enthusiasm that he has is great to see. Obviously, he's going to have to win the job and Mason is not going to give it up easily. Looking forward to that. But I like the attitude that Mitch came in with. So, you know, Rooney framing it as a battle, nothing given, everything earned, all the things you would expect the Steelers to say. Yeah. And how many times have we said that, uh, uh, you know, throughout this process, you know, I would expect Tomlin and Colbert and, and, and even, you know, Rooney, when he, whenever you get a chance, and it's rare that you get a radio interview this time of year uh, with him, but I suppose it was, uh, 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 you know, league meetings and all like that and series, uh, being there able to get him sat down for a little bit there. But, uh, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that you expect. You, you want to keep the, 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 the carrot dangled, uh, over the heads of, 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 you know, Trubisky and, Mason Rudolph as well, too, because look, I mean, uh, you know, yes, you have you know, substantially more money, you know, invested in Mitch Trubisky this offseason than you do Rudolph. But and, and you know, you go, you're the steers are going to go into it with a mindset, I'm sure of, well, uh, obviously, Mitchell Trubisky is probably going to win this. But what if it's what if it's lopsided, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, for for whatever reason, and maybe maybe not so much as as, as Mason Rudolph, uh, you know, plays out of his mind or practices and, and plays out of his mind during training camp in the preseason. But what if Trubisky just really <laughs> uh, sucks? You know, bad. You know, uh, you you got to at least be open enough, to, I think, to be able to make the decision of going with the guy that's going to give you the best chance to win right out of shoot. Now, obviously, it. For, for some, and, and I'm no uh, way, shape, or form predicting this to happen, but if for some reason uh, you made the decision that Mason did wind up being your 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 starting quarterback, I mean, you the the leash would obviously be short on that. I mean, you'd have the sure. ability, uh, you know, you're not talking like you know a, a Ben Roethlisberger situation. I mean, if you got two games into this and and Mason was your week one starter and it's not going well, well then you know you 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 had the ability to pull the plug. Now, do I think that's ultimately going to play out that way? No, but uh, I, I do understand. The, the mindset situation, at least with the Steelers, with Trubisky coming in as an outsider, uh, not not a huge contract to deal with to at least and we 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 predicted this would happen all along to at least frame it like there's mm-hmm. going to be some sort of competition when deep down inside, you know, that, you know, even if it's even if it's a close battle that Trubisky's going to get the uh, get the nod and such. 
Sure, nothing's guaranteed, nor should it be framed as such. Um, when you have the first quarterback you're looking for since 2004, um, you got to have this thing wide open, and nothing. You know, Mason nor Trubisky have done anything have done anything to to be assured of a starting job. Job. So um, you go into camp, you see what happens, you see if a rookie comes in, what he can do. I don't even want to close the door on that idea. Should it present itself? But yeah, uh, obviously Pittsburgh's not going to just say that this guy's going to have the job uh, here in April. Right. And it looked to be fun to play out, you know, to, to, to watch play out. And especially if there's your know, rookie uh, uh, draft pick in, in that room as well, too. I mean, we fully expect this team to carry four quarterbacks uh, come uh, come to start a training camp time. And, uh, you know, even though you would you would assume that if they did get a, a fourth one in a room via the draft, that that Dwayne Haskins would would you know likely be the odd man out. But stranger things have happened in the past. Yeah, an injury and who knows what else could, could change the landscape of those things. I know that certainly Pittsburgh's not guaranteed to draft a quarterback, but I still see some people on Twitter that downplay the idea of Pittsburgh's interest in a quarterback. I don't know what more this team has to do or say <laughs> to show their interest in a quarterback from their pro day visits to Tomlin literally saying we're targeting a quarterback in the draft, but the odds of them drafting one are high. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, and, and that's kind of been the feeling all off season anyway. And I, you know, I, it would be to me. It would be an upset if they don't draft one in the first mm-hmm. two rounds. At this point, now it'd be a huge upset, and it really, I mean, for, for that matter, be you know a huge upset if they didn't draft one in the first round specifically. But you know, give them a two round uh, uh, kind of variance there. But I, I, I'll be pretty shocked that they don't come out of this uh, draft in the first two rounds with a quarterback. I'm with you. So that was the uh, most inter- interesting thing for Rooney. Also said that you know he can live with the ticky-tack roughing the passer calls. And some Steeler fans didn't like that. I bet you Jack Lambert somewhere went. I don't like hearing that comment. But, yeah, roughing the passer. I pulled the numbers. Those numbers are predictably been increasing every single year. 154 roughing the passing call, passer calls last season. That's, I think, probably a league high over the past decade, probably forever. So, um, Rooney said, willing to live with that trade-off of the occasional bad call in the interest of protecting the quarterback. All right. Fair enough. I thought he answered the question fine. Yeah, I mean, people won't like it, but I can appreciate the honesty, and I understand where he and the league is coming from. The quarterbacks are the the money makers of right. the NFL. Uh, Zach Banner, uh, you know, released earlier in the off season, had a video sent out. He's been pretty quiet on social media lately, but did have a video released over the weekend, basically saying thank you and goodbye to Steelers Nation. Um, and I saw in the video clip the play, he still was wearing a brace on that right knee from that ACL tear. So it's pretty obvious that knee just. Never got right. I had a setback in training camp last year, eventually came off of IR, but really never played, I think, a couple of offensive snaps in total. And some of those were, I think, kneel down. So unfortunately, the health of that knee for Zach Banner seemed to be his downfall. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a very unfortunate story. I wrote that up the other night. And, uh, you know, you just look at a guy like him, uh, obviously a mid-round draft pick coming out was uh, uh, was a big, big guy coming out of USC. And, you know, who knows, maybe the work, you know, they just, D- didn't didn't pass the muster right out of the shoot with a, with, a, with a team like the Colts and then went on to the, the Browns and uh, saw very limited action with them, didn't last there. And then uh, uh, off the street he comes, what was it, 2000 and was it 17 or 18? I, I forget. The, yeah, I uh, can't remember, uh, somewhere the around there. there. But it was in, August, I think it was August of 2018 mm-hmm. uh, was when he was signed. It was like 10 10 days into August, you know, yeah. which is, which is, uh, kind of, kind of late there. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously being a, uh, uh, you know, a, a draft pedigree guy and, you know, uh, his, his goal, you know, I think was to come in and kind of drop that weight and get into more football shape and then start competing, uh, for the job, uh, his first year in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, spent a lot of that, uh, obviously on the practice squad and, then, uh, his first kind of real season, I guess would have been what 2019 where he got all those, uh, 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 tackle eligible snaps and, and, and those kind of things. And then you fast forward into, into 2020 and uh, the expectations were, you know, uh, starting out that, you know, a guy like Chiquamo Corfor would probably win uh, that, 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 uh, that right tackle spot, but Banner, Banner beat him out for that job and Banner got the week one start. Good for him. And you're thinking, okay, let's, uh, we got a season here to, 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 to really evaluate, evaluate a guy like Zach Banner. And then you get into what was it? The third quarter or so, or two thirds, three quarters through that game in week one against the giants. And 
you know, unfortunately uh, tore up his right knee, season ending surgery that put uh, uh, all of this 2020 season uh, behind him. And, you know, Steeders showed faith in him, giving him that two year, I think it was what, nine and a half million dollar contract uh, last off season. And he just never could rebound from that injury, you know, and even though he dressed, he, well, uh, you had kind of, uh, he dressed and I think played in that preseason game against the Eagles. And you're thinking, okay, well, you know, the, 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 you know, the road back, uh, is definitely underway. And then we, we didn't see him again, uh, mm-hmm. really at that point. And then, you know, another, another stint on, on the, uh, injured reserve list. And I think in total, what did he dress for like six or seven games, uh, last season, but, uh, he, he was, a, he was an afterthought for sure. I mean, you had guys like, you know, Joe Haig, uh, uh, getting snaps ahead of him, even when, uh, you know, Banner was dressed when, when a situation would call for it, he played, uh, I think five offensive snaps in total, uh, that be obviously just never, never was right for whatever, uh, reason there. And, you know, it, the decision was a pretty easy one there and look that the knee might be even worse off um, you know maybe it wasn't even worth it to to uh you know drop him down to a minimum base salary right here you know maybe the knee there's that that much of a concern uh with the knee that they didn't even want him want him on a minimum base salary because i always thought that you know if healthy that would probably be the, the correct route to take with zach banner uh, because, you know, if you cut him, what was he going to get on the street anyway? He's going to get that same thing. You probably knew he wanted to stay in Pittsburgh there. So the fact that he was cut, the fact that apparently there's something still going on with the knee. Yeah, that's that's not great for him. And, and he's a good dude. Uh, he did mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of good in the Pittsburgh community, uh, that kind of thing. And it's just one of those unfortunate things that happens you know, in the game of football and you, you wish him well. Now he was not released with a failed physical designation, correct? Uh, I do not believe seeing that I will double so check a uh, little interesting because it seems like that knee still could be an issue, but I don't believe he was actually failed, you know, released with that designation, the way that an Alan Hearns, for example, was, and we'll so see players occasionally pop up uh, with that label, but yeah, um, I mean, kudos to him for getting back in the league. He got his weight up to 400 pounds and, you know, dropped weight and not allowed Pittsburgh to bring him in and give him a second chance. And I think he made the most of it, just really had that, you know, very unfortunate knee injury in the fourth quarter of that Giants game that led to this this downfall. So it sucks for him. Hopefully that knee can get right in some time and he can get back in the league. All right, I'm looking at it, uh, looking at the NFL report from 316. Uh, nope, just listed as a termination of a uh, vested veteran. Uh, no failed physical or anything like that designation. Okay. I mean, obviously, that knee could still be an issue and you could you know, still be released, right. I suppose, without it. I don't know all the particulars about what comes with what, what bar needs to be cleared to, to, to have that designation, but um, just something to note there. Okay. All right, Dave, uh, Gunner, and I'm still working on the last name here, o- Osheski. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm saying it worse than I said it before, but he had an interview with uh, Missy Matthews of Steelers.com over the weekend talking about, you know, his role and impact and, you know, why he came to Pittsburgh wanting to sign that two-year contract and excited to play for Danny Smith. Yeah, and, you know, he, he mentioned, uh, again, I think he mentioned this right out of the shoot, too, that uh, you know, finding a team willing to sign him to a two-year deal uh, uh, kind of was important to him. Now, now, albeit, you know, he's not <laughs> – the way that contract of his is structured, he could be out after one season uh, mm-hmm. just as easily, though. But he took it as a sign that, you know, uh, uh, an act of faith that they wanted him for two years there. And uh, he obviously isn't – really sure of, of, of what kind of snaps he's going to get at a wide receiver uh, position. Uh, to me, he's more Ar- Arnez battle uh, than, than he is anything else here. And a guy that first and foremost should, should be able to be your return man, uh, uh, both kickoff and, 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 and punt returns and uh, in some way, shape or form beyond a couple, at least a couple of uh, return teams, whether it be coverage or, or return or who knows, maybe all even, even of a four core guy like that though. But uh, uh, <laughs> real uh, country guy, you know, overall a, a small, a very small school guy. And the fact that the guy has made it you know, as far as he has is, is really a testament uh, to him and, and who knows, you know, maybe, maybe they can develop, you know, 
some aspect to him where maybe he can get on the field for a snap or two offensively. Yeah, and not only a really small school D2 guy, but he played defensive back. He was a corner in college and then moved to receiver in the NFL. And obviously has really been more of a return man than a receiver. He's got, I think, nine passes in his Patriots career, but really kind of defied all the odds. So, yeah, he'll be the, the kick returner, punt returner, work on coverage units, be, be McLeod with additional special teams value and probably a little less value as a receiver. But right now, you know, in terms of slot receivers, what else you got? I mean, they'll add, there'll be other people by the time training camp rolls around. But again, that slot receiver position is looking awfully thin right now. Yeah, they're going to... It, it still feels like they're going to do. You would think they're going to do something uh, sure. between. So that, now. That's like the, that's like the biggest guarantee at the draft. They're going to draft a receiver. Right, right, uh, and at least one, maybe two. We'll see. Uh, but I mean, even free agents, you'd like to see them. Kevin Colbert never usually sets himself up like this, where he has to go at one particular position like that and then turn around and get that get that player on the field right away. You know, right. But he uh, did say that they that they, he has 24, 25 starting slots locked okay. up, just strong safety. So whoever he, he's got someone in mind for slot receiver, I don't know who that would be, but he's got True. someone in mind. Yeah, we'll see. So but yeah, and in terms of free agency, like Jarvis Landry wouldn't make sense. But if not him. I really don't know who you bring in. I know we've mentioned some of the names and Adam Humphreys, but there really aren't a lot of options out there. Mm-hmm. No, not at this point. Uh, speaking of the NFL draft, we haven't gotten a lot of information on the um, pre-draft visitors that are usually so important to Pittsburgh. It's nice to see that they're back this year. And in the past, the Steelers would always announce who those names are. And maybe they still will. It is still here in early April, but we know one name right now that is Cornerback, and speaking of returners, also return guy Marcus Jones from Houston. That's Aaron Wilson from Pro Football Network confirming that Marcus Jones has a pre-draft visit with the Pittsburgh Steelers sometime later in April. So interesting guy, athletic guy, um, even played some receiver last year for Houston and caught 10 passes. So small guy, undersized, but but a real good athlete and a really fun player to watch. Yeah, and uh, just so happened, uh, our own Jonathan Heitzer had a, 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 a nice interview with him, I think, uh, toward the end of the combine there, right? And uh, the timing of, uh, of that worked out well for us to kind of bump that back up to the top after that news was uh, reported. Now, he's the one with, uh, I think, had both shoulders, right? Yes, uh, surgeries on both shoulders, so not a great sign to st- for your pre-draft process. So he's obviously not worked out here at the pro day, but he told reporters, and you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll just trust them on this. He's expected to be medically cleared for training camp. Okay, and they could definitely they they don't they don't mind uh, versatile defensive backs willing to tackle and that. That guy's uh, 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 undersized, but he's. <laughs> I understand why his shoulders might be messed up. <laughs> he is not afraid to throw his body around. Yeah, and maybe they're bringing him in because they want to learn more about him because he's not been very active in the pre draft process. I'm not sure, but um, is he, that is, is he more. He, he's got to be more of a late round uh, undrafted guy, right? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I don't know exactly. I mean, I was Later thinking. Round. Or late day two, early day three is kind of my thought in my head. Let me see what NFL mock draft database. They have him as a third round uh, aggregate player right now. So, yeah, I would say late day two, early day three. The shoulder injuries probably throws a little bit of a curveball into the situation. Um, you know, if you're for top round guys, the injury factor doesn't usually hurt them too much. Mid to later round guys, it can. So, I would say third, fourth round. What is his official uh, height? 508 something 58 and then he's I don't know 180 pounds I 185 I'm not sure what his official weight is but yeah he's 58 uh that's that's tiny it's a little Tavon youngish though in terms of just his game and style I mean he's having a better athlete and has done more in terms of return value but I think it's a similar play style defensively uh that 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 one that weight where does that weight stack up on the uh Steeders draft list I would assume it's on the low end of things. I'd have to, I don't have the look for study in front of me. I'll do that here a little bit later this April once pro days officially conclude. Um, but I'm sure it's on the low end of things. And uh, speaking of pre-draft visits, I mean, here we are now, April 4th, those things, those things should start happening probably as early. I would think as tomorrow, right? To, don't, don't they usually run like Tuesday through Thursday? I don't know the exact schedule. Will they even be announced the way they were before? I'm not sure how things, because obviously there's been a pause on them. Because well, of the it, 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 it's the way the team decides. I think sure. what or not to do, and hopefully, right. But will Pittsburgh continue to, to do? Uh, you it? got me. Well, I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll know right out of shoot, right? 
Right. Yeah. Hopefully, well, we'll I be mean... able to pick. We'll be able to pick a few of them out. You know, uh, through their uh, uh, Instagram. That's true. Uh, uh, selfie uh, on a plane post and and those kind of things. Uh, you know, obviously we we like to have the whole full list when when possible. Uh, but I, I would think at minimum, if the team doesn't announce them, I, I'm willing to bet we'll be able to put a good uh, a list of I don't know, but probably two thirds of them together mm -hmm. by by the time it's all said and done. That's a really good point. It's hard not to take a picture in front of six Lombardi trophies. So hopefully mm -hmm. the prospects will do that. So, <laughs> True. True. so everybody out there, help us out. Cause I can't scroll Instagram all day looking for prospect photos. If you see something, uh, send something to Dave or I, and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly uh, credit you because that's important information that whenever those top thirties were happening, actually I shouldn't even say top 30. That's a weird phrase. Like it's not, there's no other 30, but the pre jeff 30 visits, um, you know, I've always it's, wondered why they call them that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to avoid that because it, it's a, a nonsensical phrase. But of the pre-draft visitors, Pittsburgh would always take usually two or three guys off that list. And so that's a really important list. And then they would circle back to it four years later when those guys became free agents and go sign guys like Stephen Nelson, a great example of that. So having that pre-draft uh, list is, is really important. You know, I, I think the thing about this year's list is uh, will they have all – all you know five top quarterbacks in for a visit i doubt it i think they've done enough homework on them i think what else is there to even explore um okay let's say they don't have all five what significance how how much uh how much weight does it carry if one or two of them are brought in well, if they do that, that might be more interesting. I could potentially see a Sam Howell come in because Tomlin wasn't there for the North Carolina Pro Day. I know he's throwing a second time, so they may Corral go see him. because he's a, a small, you know, an underclassman, right? Or or not. yeah, but if you go out, if you go to his pro day, you have dinner with him. I'm assuming I don't know that as a fact, but I'm assuming they did. Like usually, the the first round guys aren't brought in. Usually Pittsburgh will go see them. You know, T.J. Watt was never brought in. And usually it's the mid to late round guys you bring in. The guys that Tomlin, Colbert, maybe positional coach didn't go out and see at their pro day. Okay, so you uh, how many how many quarterbacks do you predict that they will bring in? None of the first round guys, potentially maybe a later round guy like an Ola Duncan from South Dakota State. But um, I would say none of the potential first round candidates. I will I will go as far as to predict that at least two of those top quarterbacks will be brought in. OK, any guesses on the two? Uh, I think how uh, and, and Corral. Okay. I mean, that would make the most amount of sense. Take the underclassmen and take the. Um... I mean, pick, they could bring Pickett in. <laughs> hey, hey, Kenny. hey, Kenny, you want to come in? <laughs> hey, come in for a visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but All I mean, right, that, that's local and that doesn't qualify as a, Ooh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, as a top 30. Uh, they keep I, every year, I, it seems like I have to Google that, the geographic uh, thing <laughs> on that. But I, it's like. Uh, uh, 50 it? miles, 90 miles. Yeah, but don't didn't they go as far as listening to schools now too? I don't like yeah. State and West, West Virginia. Virginia and Pittsburgh and uh it I just I, basically an old country song. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's a Pittsburgh <laughs> radius. Boy, that's uh I'm, I'm, I'm a little John Denver there, huh? Yeah. A little you country John, roads you, for you. You a John Denver fan? Can just that song. Oh, nope, okay. there's that one, one one and done on John Denver. All right. You know, you know how he died, right? I don't. Uh, uh, I think it was like a uh, one of those air gliders. Uh, oh no! Uh, accidents or whatnot, something along those lines. But uh, that was kind of big news back. You know, heck, it's it's. I wonder how many years ago it's been since John Denver died. It's got me. Say, uh, shame on you. Uh, yeah, saying, the things we look up. The John Denver uh, portion of the show brought to you by uh, Dave <laughs> Bryan's curious, never-ending mind. Yeah. What year did John uh, Denver die? And, you know, he was born in Roswell, New Mexico. I did not know that either. <laughs> I don't uh, know how you know that. but uh, uh, Let's see here. Airplane crash. And he died 97, October 12th, 1997 at age of 53. Uh, his death. Denver died on, uh, let's see, when his light home built aircraft uh, uh, crashed into Monterey Bay near Pacific Grove, California. OK, so there mm. you go. What were you doing in 97? What was Dave Bryan? Oh, you, uh, you're legally allowed to tell people what uh, you were doing in 97. What, what, what was I doing? You mean uh, as far as uh, illicit drugs or what? I, I mean, I really, that wasn't generally the scope of my question. I was okay. letting you answer it, though, however you would like to answer yeah, my I'll, question. I, I'll pass on that. Okay, that's probably a good call. I was uh, getting ready for kindergarten, so that okay. just kind of 
you you're on the illicit drugs. I'm on the numbers and painting. <laughs> you were just trying not to eat glue, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a different kind of drug, maybe. Anyway, let's bring it back here to. Did you NFL. have? Did you ever? Did you go? Uh, did you have the fat crayons uh, in in school? Believe it or not, I went to a uh, uh, I went to a uh, Christian. Uh, kindergarten school went to Pensacola Christian and mm. uh, that that obviously became Pensacola Christian still around today uh, back back home and it, it's become a huge uh, uh, not only you know kindergarten it, it goes grade school all the way up through college and boy the the money that that place has and the facility they have is it's one of the I guess one of the most highly uh, regarded kind of Christian schools in the uh, in, in the southeast. We used to call it uh, because it was so big and and really right slap dab in the uh, in in the middle of Pensacola. We used to call it Six Flags over Jesus. <laughs> 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 You're not welcome back. Uh, but I, I went to kindergarten uh, through uh, uh, four or five year kindergarten through uh, through Pensacola Christian and see how I turned out. So uh, yeah. that that's uh, I, I'm, I'm only telling you that because uh, when young Trevor comes along, oh, you know, uh, that can we you stop? Know, uh, you might want to homeschool him. <laughs> All right. Noted on too much uh, more information than I could have ever needed. Did I you have the fat, fat crayons, crayons or not? I don't think so. I think we just uh, had the regular like 32, 64 box of Crayola. Okay. Yeah. All right. We had those big old fat crayons, Crayolas. All right, Dave. Let's um get back to the NFL draft here. And uh, one guy that we'll see if they bring in for a pre-draft visit, someone I think you'd be excited about is Pierre Strong. We don't know if he's coming in for a visit, no. but you wanted to talk about Pierre Strong and, you know, just you're, you're a fan of his game. I tell you, and this is a kid that was out in Las Vegas for the uh, for the East West Shrine Bowl. So uh, our own Josh Carney and 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 Melanie Friedlander and Owen Straley all got a good look at him, and uh, obviously watched a little bit of tape leading into uh, uh, up up ahead of that. And you know, one thing that stuck out to me, I think during the uh, during the practices of, of, of watching the All Twenty Two tape and all along for that, uh, and I put this on Twitter at the time, and I, I didn't realize I did. I circled back to it the other day. I, I forget. Why was he even on? Why did why did he even come up? Oh, because Jonathan did a uh, profile on him on on the site. Uh, mm -hmm. What was it uh, yesterday? And that got me thinking back back about him. Look, I I think Pierre Strong might end up being uh, uh, the still the draft at the running back position here uh, uh, this year because I think he's going to be obviously a mid to later round uh, type of guy there. I think he was. I I really think there's a good chance he might be the one of the top one or two pass protecting uh, running backs uh, in, in this year's draft class. And when you look at uh, uh, runs and breakaway speed and, and, and break tackle ability and all like that, uh, it's there on tape. And in fact, I don't have the exact count on him overall, but just uh, loosely by, by looking at, you know, uh, game by game, uh, sheets and, and, and longest runs on him. He had at a minimum of 30 explosive runs or 20 yards or more, uh, mm. uh, during his four seasons at, at, at South Dakota. What a name, Jack, Jack rabbits. That that's a great, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's a great thing. And look, they had, uh, didn't they have a uh, Tom show at the, uh, uh, at the pro day. Yeah. And Phil Kreidler and, and for Phil Kreidler. And uh, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and think it just wasn't for the quarterback there, you know, uh, on top of there, but this is a kid that had third, at least 30 explosive runs. I'd venture a guess that it was more along the lines of 40 in total. And uh, this kid can scoot. He can catch the football. He can pass protect and all like that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not high on the Steelers drafting a running back you know, maybe at all, unless they got into the later rounds here, because this team has so many needs all over the place here, especially uh, uh, only having seven picks. We'll have to see if they have to give any of those picks away to, 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 you know, maybe move up or what, what, what have you there. But uh, if they did get into the later, you know, uh, later rounds needing a running back and it would probably end up being the, the way the way it sets up right now with the Steelers draft picks, they obviously don't have a fifth. I kind of find it hard to imagine like a guy like Pierre Strong would, would last until the sixth round. Uh, I get you know, stranger things happen, I guess, but uh, he's probably a fourth round guy if the if the Steelers were to take him. Now, uh, I'd grit my teeth a little yeah. bit. You, 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 I was going to say, are you advocating for a fourth round running? No, back? not I, I'm not. 
but if they do, I would hope it'd be a guy like him. Okay. You know, uh, and that list is very, very, very small. It's a list of one. Yeah, and it's just Pierre Strong. Um, Pretty much. Did he play against any D one competition? They have like an early game, you know, against uh, the Kansas. I think like Colorado or something. Okay. Uh, Did he do well in that game? I'm just yeah. Curious. I think he had two. Uh, now, don't quote me on this, but I've got a. You know how my memory is is sometimes. Uh, I think he had two explosive runs in that game against Colorado. I think I watched. I think I watched that full game. Believe it or not. Uh, I believe it. You don't got to twist my arm to believe that. Uh, hold on a minute here. And let me pull up some, some data here. Yeah. Not that it's a sale end all, but it is nice to see those small school guys be able to perform against bigger competition. You know, even knowing that they might be overmatched or offensive line might be an issue, but we see a guy play well against a, a D one school that makes you feel more comfortable in the evaluation and projection of his game. All right, here's what I have in my notes. Uh, two explosive runs against Colorado last year. So uh, let me see what he had as far as a uh, stat line, maybe total uh, in, in in that game. It's funny how some things just stick in your head, you know? Yeah, yeah. With me, that's a lot of different things. <laughs> some, of of are, some of them are, are, are rated uh, too. Uh, let's see here. Colorado... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Colorado State. Okay. I put Colorado in here as a shorthand, so it was Colorado State. Uh, 13 attempts, 138 yards, two touchdowns, uh, uh, had a 48-yard run, was his longest run in that game. Uh, he also had three receptions for eight yards uh in that uh in that game as well too now oh, well, and they beat colorado state too they blew the yeah 40 off. 42 to 23 in that game and that was the right. that was the opening week game evidently yeah. uh as well too i'm trying to look if there was any other uh you know they played uh north you know, i don't north north dakota state you know which is a a, a powerhouse at least mm-hmm. in, in 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 lower conference he had 23 for 156 yards uh in that one in a 75 yard uh, uh, scamper in that one, uh, two touchdowns in that game as well. Uh, 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 uh last year as well, too. And uh, let's see, looks like Strong had a 48 yard touchdown run to open the scoring against Colorado State. So I want to go back and see that play, right? Uh, I'll see if I can dig that up at some point today yeah. here. But uh, that was obviously the, the t- I, yeah, I would think Colorado State would be the toughest competition, you know, at least major competition that he played uh, last season there. 2020, shortened season, uh, no big schools there. Did they even play at all? Did they play in 2020? They played like five games, it looks okay. like. That's more than uh, most FCS schools. Right. And then uh, Minnesota, he played against Minnesota, eh? Uh, in looks like the first game of uh, that's a very bad uh, imitation of a Minnesota yeah. accent there. <laughs> 2019, uh, 12 carries 53 yards in that game, two, two receptions, 59 yards. And then the other thing that I popped out, I thought the other day, where was it? I'm, I'm missing it here, but I uh, thought I found something from his rookie season. But uh, his longest run of his career was something like, I think, 85 yards. I put that on Twitter uh, yesterday, and I think that came, when was that? Last, uh, it was last season against, uh, who was it against? Uh, Southern Illinois, know. I think. Uh, okay. I put that one on the Twitter machine. So, uh, and, and I think Jonathan said the guy has like, he's seven for seven on career passes with four touchdowns. Is that true? Yeah, well, I, I tell you, there, there's one, uh, there's a couple of trick plays that they did with him, and, uh, uh, you know, j- you like the design. I've, I've only seen, like, two of them, I think, in, 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 in total there, but uh, they did get creative with him at South South Dakota State. Yeah, not that you're drafting him for that, but right. it's just interesting. A guy, seven to seven, four touchdowns, that just kind of speaks to, I think, the overall athletic profile that uh, Strong has. Right. Very, very impressive. Look, I once again put me down for him being still the draft for for somebody uh, at the running running back position. I'm and once again, I'm not advocating. Well, I don't know. You know, they, sounds they, like you are. We just we just talked about just a little while ago about how, <clears throat> uh, you know, what is Anthony McFarlane to this team at this point? You know, almost nothing. I mean, the guy's chances are super slim, and. You look at the list of uh, 
available free agents out there right now. It's not great. Uh, I think at least a guy like Pierre Strong, measurable wise, come, comes uh, closer to what your list of what the Steelers look for uh, uh, kind of, I think he's over 200 pounds for starters and, and uh, obviously has the speed there. And I don't know about special teams ability. I haven't gone that far there, but uh, if they were, I, let, I, let me just end it this way. If they were to draft a running back uh, this year, I would hope it would be a guy like Pierre strong and, and specifically because he can home run it for you. All right, that makes sense. And again, Pittsburgh at that pro day, so they don't dip into those FCS waters too often. Uh, but it's worth looking at. Not that it matters a whole lot. Who's who's the last FCS running back they've drafted? I can't think of one. Usually when they go running back, they're going power five. They want guys that are workhorse backs that played against top competition. I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. That might has be Colbert before, ever even done it? Yeah, that might be before that might be before Colbert. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, again, not that it can't. Obviously, there's some interest that appears in Pierre Strong and also the quarterback, Chris Little Duncan, but I just, for the historical nature of it, and, and, and we know this team does not go into the FCS D2 waters often, so that, that is a, a correlation and a thought there. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work down the list real quick here. Uh, I mean, Frank Summers was not, he was not, he's he was a full G5. Back. Yeah, yeah, he was like a fullback, but he's also doesn't even qualify on that list. But um, just trying uh, to think about see. smaller school runners. I mean, uh, what, what did you, uh, 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 you know, I don't know why they list Dre Archer as a wide receiver. Did you, yeah. did you think of him as a wide receiver? I always thought of him as a running back. A running back, but he became positionless and ultimately useless. The running back uh, primarily because yeah. that's what he was at Kent State and also obviously doesn't qualify in the FCS. Right. Uh, looking down the list here. I mean, just the list of FCS players drafted overall is pretty small. I mean, it's Hargrave, it's Nick Williams, it's uh, Cortez Allen. Yeah, I, it would be a first for sure for, I think, for Kevin Colbert specifically. Yeah. So, again, not saying they can't, just would be interesting history of it all. And I think Strong's a, an interesting talent that, and I think they need a backup running back. And I think the draft's a better way to get that. It's cheaper. It's a guy with less mileage and a guy you'll have for, for four years. Mm-hmm. All right, Dave, with free agency slowing down, I think it's a good time for you to give your latest Steelers cap update now that everything's, I think, settled. And I think everything's been put on the NFL's PA system. Is there anything outstanding in terms of contracts? Yeah, it's another day to kind of celebrate. Everything's uh, uh, – it's rare when you can catch up uh, when the uh, NFL PA sheet – uh, actually catches up in in real time to what where the team is at. We we've we've reached that uh, time just the other day there. So uh, now we have the contracts of uh, Gunnar Olszewski, Jannard Avery in, Carl Joseph in, and all those were just as we predicted they would be. Uh, the Avery contract was a minimum uh, veteran signing benefit contract with one hundred fifty two thousand five hundred maximum. Uh, uh, signing bonus involved with that. And then the Carl Joseph contract was no signing bonus for you. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then that's also a one year vet uh, uh, benefit contract uh, because of the reduced cap charge on that benefit contract on Joseph. And the fact that he did not uh, uh, receive a signing bonus, he did not move the salary cap needle at all uh the avery contract only moved at 152,500 because that's the displacement of the rule of bottom of the rule 51 uh salary uh plus obviously the the the, the, the signing bonus difference which in other words was 152,500 so as we sit here presently uh alex the uh the steelers are 13 Fifteen million two hundred fifty-five thousand nine hundred seventeen uh, under the cap to the penny in real time. Uh, <laughs> there uh, and uh, you you know how proud I am. I know uh, of 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 this when I uh, especially before even free agency starts to have it balanced to the penny and then you know you, once you get a good starting point like that anyway it's usually easy to kind of move maneuver along with it on top of it there but uh, uh, thirteen point two million uh, if you're scoring at home under the cap. Uh, they they obviously at this point did not do anything with the contract of Cam Hayward uh, as far as a restructure goes. Now, 
uh, that means they did not restructure his roster bonus. Uh, he obviously still has uh, a base salary that you can work with at any time during the off season. But uh, instead of ha- instead of ha- uh, being able to free up six point five eight six million dollars uh, earlier in, in in the off season with a restructure, they're now down to the fact that if they do max restructure him later on this off season, they would only clear up. Three point five eight six million dollars in 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 salary cap space. There uh, at this point, to be honest with you, uh, the fact that they didn't do anything with him uh, before his uh, roster bonus was due, I really will be surprised if they restructure him. I, I think something would have to happen, you know, where they would need emergency funds at this point uh, for them to restructure the contract at Cameron Avery. And that makes sense too. his age and just a couple of years left on the contract past this year. Uh, it would make sense now at this point to just to leave it alone, being as how they didn't need to dip into that, uh, 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 you know, before paying him his, his roster bonus this year. Uh, the other big restructure that's out there that they're going to have to do to some degree, I think at this point is TJ Watt. Uh, there's up to $17.2 million worth of, of, of room they can create that way. Uh, and it all depends on what they have planned really uh, for the rest of this off season. Now, when you look at forthcoming cost that this team has kind of predictable estimated uh, forthcoming cost for the, for the Steelers moving forward, they are, you could call them technically in the whole $4.4 million Uh you know, at this point, but obviously those, those, those expenses come, you know, at different lines in the sand with most of those being at the start of the regular season here. So, uh, they'll have to do something to free up some money. Now, uh, I, I thought about this last night, technically, I think if you were to get the situation and maybe cut Stefan to it and, make him, let's say, a post-June 1st cut in the process, that might be enough to give you, you know, not only enough room to operate, you know, for the rest of the – in other words, you it might put you in a position where you don't have to cut touch the the, uh, the contract of T.J. Watt uh, mm. moving forward there. But uh, uh, to it would probably be the only guy, you know, making him, you know, a, a post-June 1st cut. Uh, and, you know, maybe even a normal cut because I think there's like $4 million that can be saved that way. It would be tight depending on what this team does. Obviously, how the Minka uh, contract is structured. And, we, you know, I don't think they're going to extend Deontay Johnson, but they always could. And mm-hmm. if they did, that would obviously eat up some cap room that way. And then you got a guy like Chris Boswell that, you know, they'll have to make a decision on uh, whether or not to, to do something with him. Now, his, his cap number wouldn't jump you know exponentially but it probably wouldn't move up just a a, a a tiny bit with him on top of it there so you know looking at a guy like to it specifically uh and 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 whether or not they use the post june 1st mechanism will probably tell us a lot about whether or not this team will have to restructure the contract of tj watt and to what degree see they say nine $9 million in salary cap space uh, in 2022 by making to it a post June 1st cut. Uh, but by cutting him regularly, they say 4.295 million. And I just told you as part of my recap there that this team's technically based on projections that I have 4.4 million dollars in a hole. So you could cut him regularly depending on you know, not make him a post June first cut, which obviously would prevent you from rolling dead money into 2023, which would mm-hmm. make a lot of people happy. Uh, but you, if you went a normal cut route with him, and and you know, let's say you didn't extend a player like Deontay Johnson, that would put you in the neighborhood of maybe not having to do T.J. Watt at all. So uh, that's the, I guess, the biggest question mark when it comes to the Steelers moving forward from here is what would a, what would a make a contract look like? And, you know, even, even if that ended up using more salary cap space, I don't think it will, but if it did, it wouldn't be much. Uh, The Mm -hmm. Deontay Johnson deal obviously would, would, would raise his cap number 
you know, whether or not they do that would uh, is a huge, huge question mark. And then obviously Chris Boswell uh, would, would be the other. And, and then the future of Stefan to it uh, is a question mark that we've had for, for a while. Right. Now. What are the financial implications if he goes on the reserve retired list? Because I would expect him to go there as opposed to Pittsburgh cutting him if he says I'm not coming back. Uh, well, then you have to just, you know, then it goes into, do you go after that signing bonus proration and all like that? So well, that, let's assume that you don't, is there, but you're not paying the base salary, right? So you get that cap, uh, freedom, right? You, you, I mean, it's treated like a cut basically. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, I mean, cause I don't think they would cut him. I think cause if you, cause if he wants to come back and changes his mind a year from now, you want to be able to retain the rights to him. If you cut him, obviously you, you lose those rights. True. True. Right. I mean, he's still got, let's see, to it still under contract. Well, I mean, 2022 is uh, the last year anyway, because there's voids after that. Yeah, but you still. And I don't know how I, I, you know, I I wonder how the toll aspect would come into that. That might be a good, good, good good question question for for Joel Corey being as how, you know, technically there's three years past this year of contract left uh, uh, with him. Yeah, that, I, I, I would have to I would have to research that out there. But. Uh, and but if you retired, I mean, you you, you obviously I would say that base base value. It'd be it'd be definitely interesting to see how they treated that moving. Forward. Yeah. So but I think uh, that's more likely than a cut just because that's a guy that could change his mind. Obviously, He's still young, young enough that he may a year from now say, you know what? I do want to come back and play. Football. Right. Right. So if you did that, you'd obviously save the base salary of nine million uh, there. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, the dead money, obviously, uh, uh, or the proration amount for, for that year would stay in intact, I would as- assume. Uh, I wonder how how the how the uh, uh, acceleration would happen uh, uh, with the rest of that as well, too. That's another interesting question for Joel, Joel Coy that mm-hmm. I'll have to reach out to him on. And, and just to clarify, I believe I know the answer to this. But when you say thirteen point two million in cap space, that's total, total cap space. That's not effective usable. That's just all the space they have, not considering earmarks for draft classes and rainy day funds and all those things. Correct? Right, real okay. time is thirteen point two five five million. Uh, and so when you say they're four and a half in the hole, that's because you're considering you're, you are to then earmark money for draft class and practice squad and in season money and all that. Correct. Right. Right. The, and I had that broken down by projected right. future salary caps expenses, you know, cause it's, it's around $2.7 million offset to, uh, to sign uh, the class as it sits right now. Uh, the picks as they sit right now, the end of rule of 51 uh, players, number 52 and 53, that's 1.4 million practice squad estimated at around 3.5 million. Uh, and then, you know, I usually I've been using ten million dollars as in season amount of space that this team will want to have for both practice squad elevations and in season replacement fund and all like that. And you know, people keep saying, "Oh, you overshoot that." Well, I didn't overshoot. I haven't overshot that the last two seasons. So, uh, you know, I, I think ten million is about what this team's going to want to have in 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 free salary cap space going into the season. So because of that you have to treat it as if it were you know, cost effectively. You know? And how much money could they free up with the restructure of TJ Watt? I know there's a range there. They could do it however they want to Obviously, do it. But yeah, the max is 17.2. So more, more than enough. That's why I've said all off season, you know, this team is, can do absolutely whatever they want to do, you know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they're still in good shape. So they can, right. they can go still sign a Tyron Matthew if they want to. Correct. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and people say, well, how can you say this, this team is in great cap shape when they uh, might have to restructure a guy for 17 minutes? Well, look, I mean, that is, it, it's par for the course, uh, especially with the, the way this, the, you know, the way the Steelers do business here to restructure a contract or two, or, or two and they have it uh, uh, so far this season, you know, at, at all. Now, now, will they, I, Look, uh, T.J. Watt's contract is is large enough and has enough, you know, uh, uh, obviously future years on it. And with the cap escalating, uh, it would be a huge golf clap, I think, for the Steelers, especially coming out of a uh, situation uh, last year where there was what, like a twenty five million dollar shortfall, what they thought the cap was going to be and and them having to. Uh, to use the avoidable years, it ended up with you know the vet the the uh, the uh, uh, 
you know, dead money that they had mm-hmm. this off season uh, in, in several players for them to get through all of this off season. And let's assume they restructured TJ Watt and, and had to do it to the max of 17.2 million. I mean, you know, kudos, kudos to them. Uh, it's starting to feel like though, they might not have to go that full amount uh, uh, with, with Watt. you know, but, but once again, What's going to happen? You'll answer me some of my questions and I'll answer some of yours <laughs> about whether or not they're going to restructure TJ Watt because uh, the Deontay Johnson, a uh, possible extension for him, a possible extension for <clears throat> Chris Boswell uh, would obviously play you know a role in, 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 in how much they're, they're, they're needing to get. But uh, on the flip side, once again, you know, uh, some sort of doing something with to it, you know, retirement, uh, uh, contract termination, something along those lines, uh, would, you know, obviously impact whether or not students have to do TJ Watt and to what degree on top of it. By the way, to get even nerdier, did you listen to Pat Fryermuth's comments about how the Steelers pay out some of their signing bonus stuff? I don't know. Maybe this is not news to you, but it was a little bit of a, a window to me. Did you hear any of those comments from Fryer? No, 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 I didn't. What do you say? Uh, it was, I'll have to send you the, exactly the, the timestamp of when it was, but basically for, for him, uh, they pay out 15 days after the contract signs a signing bonus. He said that Pittsburgh usually likes to give those in installments, uh, but for Fryermuth, they gave him the whole signing bonus for once. I guess it kind of depends on just who the player is and if they trust them enough for that kind of money or not. So that was just a little bit of insight in terms of how Pittsburgh handles their rookie signing bonuses. Yeah. And, and it, it really depends on player. I've heard situations with them where they, where they, you know, they, they, they do put it in the contract where they pay it out almost like in weekly installments. And that happens around the league too. Sure. I mean, it, yeah. it, it depends on, upon, uh, it depends on the team and the negotiation and the agent, what the agent's trying to strive for and, and, and those kind of things there. So, uh, I don't know if it, I just, you know, not knowing specifics on every rookie, you know, and, and, and the payout structure for them makes it hard to, to say whether or not that's unique or not. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just insight I didn't have before. This isn't like earth shattering news, but uh, apparently 15 days after these guys signed, they uh, far, far, who said he woke up 15 days after and, and was a very happy man when he checked mm. his uh, bank account. Mm. Sort of like so, Alex, right? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> All right, Dave, let's uh, finish up here with the NFL draft here. I know it's been a wait and hopefully it's uh, worth the wait. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you love it, but my quarterback rankings came out today on Steelers Depot of the 2022 NFL class, the top five quarterbacks in this class. I focus on the five that uh, Mike Tomlin and Kevin Colbert have watched during the pro day circuit. So, you know, Willis, Howell, Corral, Ritter, Pickett, and I gave my top five with my grades, NFL comp, and a breakdown of what I like and what I don't like about each player. So here's my top five overall, and we can kind of run through them, and Dave will talk about, you know, what you agree with, what you disagree with, and just overall thoughts. My top five quarterbacks of this class are – Malik Willis, number one, Matt Corral, number two, Sam Howell, number three, Kenny Pickett, number four, and Desmond Ritter, mm. number five. First round grades on just two quarterbacks, Willis, Corral, Howell, Pickett get second round grades and a third round grade on Desmond Ritter. Mm. So just off the top here, do you have a list? If not, that's that's totally fine. But what are your thoughts on the overall just rankings and grades? Uh, I would I would have uh, had I would probably swap Corral and pick it. So you have Pickett as your number two quarterback. Yeah, I, I would okay. put Pickett uh, number two. Uh, I bet you would go how I'm a little surprised you didn't, didn't go how because I know you're, you're kind of big on him. No, no. I mean, I, I mean, how am I big on him? I, I just I mean, all, I went back and just kind of, you know, just making sure uh, accounting for a little bit older tape on some of these guys. Uh, I just went back down looking at deeper into some stuff on Sam Howe uh, and, you know, just kind of reconfirming some things I think overall, because look, his 2020 tape is, is his best tape, but, but there's, there are things in there make, make you grimace for sure mm-hmm. uh, uh, with him. Uh, I think how I, I, me having picket number two is more about uh less variance, I think with him in my head and, and, and a guy that you could get on the field, uh, right away there, I, uh, it is a selling point, uh, for me with him overall, uh, obviously none of these five, I think if, if this draft was like last year, 
all, mm. all, all these five would be behind, you know, Mac Jones, you know, where, 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 where he went. I mean, some of these guys wouldn't, he, most, most of these guys probably, probably would be later second round, third round guys, you know, mm -hmm. uh, overall. Uh, and I, I, I don't think we can state that enough throughout this process is, man, you look at this, the, just these five quarterbacks alone, Willis is the only one that makes you think, man, I wonder what, what this kid's uh, ceiling is really mm -hmm. when it, when it comes to that. Now I've, I've gotten more so with how, with wondering, and I wonder, wonder, you know, how much, how much growth this kid still has in him here. Yeah. Uh, I don't really do that on Ritter or Corral or Pickett, to be honest with you. I kind of view those guys as what you see is what you get. Uh, but there are moments on Sam Howell's tape that make you think, yeah, I wonder, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why I think what we said the other day, uh, at this point, and, and after watching, and I must have watched 100, 150 plays of Hal uh, over the weekend, um, I think he has the, the second most uh, growth left in him of the quarterbacks, of the top five quarterbacks here. Okay. Yeah, I shouldn't have said you were big. I, I should have said you were intrigued by right. Sam Howell. It, it felt like there was some intrigue about what he could be. But let's go through the list here one by one, and we'll start with Malik Willis. More, more than anything with him mm -hmm. is, is I, I had watched more 2021 tape on Howell than okay. I had on 2020 tape. And the narrative on how all offseason has been, oh, you got to watch his 2020 tape more in depth. So yeah. – I went and watched six games of it, you know, so. Did the narrative hold up? Did you feel, feel like how it was oh, yeah, much better I, than 20 yeah, with yeah, the I, supporting cast? Yeah, I, 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 I really do. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I wonder, I mean, was it the, wasn't the narrative, I, I forget how much talk there was about him potentially coming out uh, or could he have come out last year? Yeah, he could have come well, he was a sophomore. I don't know if he was a redshirt uh, sophomore. Yeah, I, don't I don't know if he was eligible or not, actually. But uh, look, if all you had to go on was was his nineteen and two thousand twenty tape right now, I don't. I'm not so sure the narrative might not be a little bit different on him right now. Yeah. Well, the buzz last year was he was going to be the first quarterback taken this year. And right. That was the the buzz, and then the, the down twenty twenty one happened. But to go back to Malik Willis, number one quarterback, and then we'll come back to Howell in a couple of minutes. I think I think I have the same thoughts on Willis that most people do, and and what you have in terms of the upside, the traits, the potential. There are things to work on, um, but he's the guy that made me say wow in good ways, mostly the most often uh, when and, watching. And that's what tape. we said all offseason, yeah. pretty much for him, right? You know, it was like, right. man, look at that. But on the flip side, there's equal amount of, oh, look at that. You know, uh, that, that kind of goes with him. Yeah. Um, but in, in Liberty was like a, it's a smaller school, but it's D1 and they were successful. They won what 10 games and eight games. He has a, Willis has a six and four road record. I think maybe the only quarterback on this list, maybe Ritter as well, um, that has a, a winning record. On the road, they beat Syracuse, they beat Virginia Tech, they had some really close losses on the road as well, won both of their bowl games, put up big numbers in those games. Um, but you just talked about that, that, that dynamic player as a runner, as a passer, um, the big arm, making off platform throws. There is going to need to be work on his overall lower body mechanics. It's tied to his accuracy, need to be uh, hitch up in the pocket more often. We'll have to learn when to not try to make the hero ball type play and things like that. But my comp to him, and this is a pretty common one as well, is is Mike Vick. And I think I mentioned this a while back on the podcast, a right-handed version of Mike Vick. Maybe not quite the 4-3 runner that Vick was, but not too far off. And so um, there are going to be some negative plays, but there are more positive plays and negative ones. And to me, that's all worth it. What do you... There, there's a narrative now that's being strongly attacked or attached when it comes to Willis right now is, oh, well, he couldn't beat out some of these kids at Auburn. Yeah, well, Joe Burrow transferred too, didn't he, <laughs> once upon a time? So I, I don't put a lot of stock into that. I just look at what he did, at, at, at where he played, and, and, and that's all I can really go off of. So I, I don't know the whole circumstances about why he couldn't win that Auburn job initially, but that was several years ago, and he's probably a much different player in person uh, now compared to then, I'm, I'm, I'm positive he is. So I don't really worry about that too much. 
Uh, and once again, uh, you view him ex- extreme, uh, extremely. Uh, look, he's only got what two seasons of, of playing quarterback, right? And right. Uh, there's any teams that any team that drafts him are not going to be doing him any favors by expecting him to play a, a lot. You should put in packages for him, you know, limited mm-hmm. type packages for him. But uh, for the most part, this kid needs to sit the bench a year. Yeah, I'm in agreement there. I think a year on the bench would be good for him. Maybe some specialty stuff the way it was for Lamar and Jalen Hurts earlier in their career. By the you way, know, I, I think all these kids, uh, except for maybe Pickett, should should sit their rookie season. Right. Uh, the first thing I noticed about uh, Malik Willis was his calves. Like, <laughs> this is a random thing, but, like, he's got the biggest calves I've ever seen on a quarterback. Like, he's short, but he is, like, a thick densely built dude that can break tackles and step out of tackles, They're but also make pro day right. uh, good morning football uh, showing uh, his pro day uh, right now. And, and if you remember during that, uh, I think during, during, during that pro day segment, they said, uh, boy, he, he purposely wore those shorts that he wore. To, <laughs> to Look kinda, at those calves. I mean, that guy has got to, he's got a, he's got a bottom half on him yeah. for sure. He'd- he does not skip leg day. That's for sure, Malik Willis. So, um, again, is there risk there? Yes, there's a risk with all these quarterbacks. Is it more so than with Willis, arguably? Um, but from everything I've heard, and I obviously can't confirm this, he was good in the interview process. Has a good football IQ. Obviously, I think a good character overall. And those are all intangibles that are hard for me to put in a scouting report, but also seem to be you know very positive and important boxes he's checking. He is a very likable dude. The, dude, the more you watch his interviews and and i i think he is, i really think he is who he seems to be at least from an outsider uh uh look at him as far as character goes and all yeah i think that's well said so that's the book on malik willis and again you can check out all my notes and thoughts on steelersdepot.com article stick to the top of the page number two i think is a guy we'll disagree with uh on some uh matt corral from old miss i think He's the most accurate passer in this class, the most consistent, you know, pinpoint accuracy, yak throw, rack throw kind of guy. And to me, accuracy is my number one trait I look for in a quarterback. And I think his overall quickness and his release and just the way that he plays with that accuracy is going to make him a very effective quarterback in the NFL. Uh, the thing with him, too, that I just I mean, wh- where's the wow plays with him, you know? Well, I'm wowed by the accuracy. I don't think wow has to always be the 55 okay. yard throw off your back foot kind of thing. I think when you can consistently put the ball on the money in tight windows that are, you know, guy in stride, 15 yards downfield. I think to me that that's where I was. Wowed. I was also wowed by the release, like how quick and compact that release is, is the fastest release in this class by far. And one of the faster releases I've seen from a quarterback in, in a long time. Look, this is, this is not a science. I just, I just did not, did not see it with him. Did you think he was an accurate quarterback? What did you think? Would you come in on his accuracy? I, mean, I thought accuracy was okay, me. but uh, also his, his depth of target was a lot was 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 a, sure. a little bit shorter as well too. Uh, yeah, I, I just he just didn't pop on the the tape didn't speak to me when it came to him at yeah. all. No, I agree that one of the knocks I have is that he played in Lane Kippen's offense. It was more conservative. It was a lot of five to fifteen yard kind of stuff. They didn't take a lot of shots. I think you mentioned last week that when they took shots, it was double moves and they were just trying to scheme up. That's that type of stuff. I think he has a good arm though. I mean, he didn't he didn't chuck it downfield a lot but when he did. The ball has good spin. The accuracy on the deep balls not as good as it is, you know, short to intermediate. But um, I think he's got a good arm. It's not it's not Willis, but it's it's not terrible. It's 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 solid. I, I there were times for me thinking, man, Lane Kiffin really makes this kid look good. <laughs> Is it okay to say that? I mean, uh, it, it felt like that. You know, so. Yeah, I think it's true. A lot of because every college runs RPOs now. Like we're gonna say these guys were all RPO systems, but like that's just how the college, that's how the NFL right. game practically is these days. But I mean, you're right. But I think. You know, you want to be any college coach worth their weight should be making their quarterbacks look good. And I think Corral has accuracy that you know transcends just the overall scheme. Also, and this who, is who would you call the second most accurate quarterback in this class? Then of those five, mm, second most accurate. Um, I think it's a big gap between Corral and the next guy. I'm trying to think who was second most accurate. I might lean Pickett. I think Howell has the best deep ball accuracy in terms of that. So I think you have to kind of break down what kind of pass. I think Howell has the best deep ball accuracy of anybody in this class. In terms of overall accuracy, it might be either Pickett or Howell. But I think Willis's accuracy is better than people so give give it credit for. Have uh, I, I to me, I think Howell's probably the most 
the single most accurate, but uh, okay. uh, I, I I need to go try to go back and do this with Corral now as well too. Did you find any of those uh, far hash uh, opposite you know field side throws you know on, on say like the twelve yard outs? Mm-hmm. Not a lot. And also, I know I just hedged really bad on your answer about who's the most accurate because I mentioned every single quarterback besides Tyson right. Ritter. So I think Pickett would be my answer, maybe short answer overall. Um, I didn't see that a lot because it just wasn't asked to do it. So I don't know if he can or can't. It just wasn't really schemed up to do, which might be an answer that he can't do it. But the arm to me was not – I think arm strength's important, but it's not the sale end all for me in terms of my list of hierarchy of, of most important traits a quarterback has to have. I mean, that's become one of those things now that I, I that I automatically put on my mm-hmm. list to check now at some yeah. point, you know, uh, and look, it's easy to get. I, I'm that guy that when I'm watching tape, sometimes I get caught up in the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> do you do you find yourself doing that? Sometimes you get caught up in, in, in especially if it's the TV version of getting caught up in the game and you're like, oh, man, I forgot to look. You know, uh, uh, you you're watching more of the game. Uh, do you listen to the games on sound on TV tape, or do you have the audio turn? Because oh, I turn no. the audio off, so I'm not I, 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 I turn it off. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 nine times out of ten, there because I'm super easily distracted. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff, there. But sometimes I I just get up and 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 you know another player will catch my eye or something along, along those lines and all like that. But uh, uh. I, I, I try to be real cognizant, no, though, of, of seeing if they can make certain throws, you know, right. uh, off platform, uh, uh, rollout type stuff, uh, far hash type stuff. Obviously, the deep ball and 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 how that deep ball looks good, because, look, I mean, you could have two quarterbacks throw it uh, uh, 55 yards down the field, look totally different. Right. You know, sure. Uh, uh, the flight of the ball and, and, and those kind of things there, but with him specifically, I found found myself warning more when it came to the deep ball and when it, uh, specifically when it came to kind of those uh, far hash like type throws. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, his arm is not overwhelming. I think Howell has a better arm. I think Willis has a better arm. I think Corral is above Ritter and Pickett, but he's not in that that top tier of guys. The other thing I love about Corral, and again, this is an intangible thing. Some people will roll their eyes and say you're just being too too flowery with your comments, Alex, is, is Corral's toughness. This guy played through not one but two bad ankles this past year, played in the bowl game, and I won't ever penalize a player for not playing in a bowl game, but I think I have to kind of I, – I do like when a guy plays in the bowl game whenever he kind of finishes out the season with his team, especially at the quarterback position. Um, and so this guy did not miss a game. There were games he got carted off. I feel like the Auburn game, he gets carted off and comes back and plays. And, I mean, he didn't play particularly well, but um, I think there's some context in his tape as well later in 2021 because he was playing on two bad ankles and that, and that toughness and that guttiness to still play and compete. I know the Steelers are going to love that about Matt Corral, and I do as well. Uh, this is a delicate uh, subject here, but, you know, he's uh, 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 talked about battle and depression quite a, you know, uh, does that, how much of that matters? I think it all matters. I think you want to get the entire profile on a player and understand who he is, but I would not not draft the player. I can certainly appreciate his openness and honesty and how candid he is talking about his mental health and something I think you're seeing more and more in sports players and athletes talk about that despite guys that are in great positions of money and fame and, and, and just prestige to be able to talk about the struggles they go through is really admirable. So um, it, it's not going to affect my drafting of, of crowd one bit. Okay. Well, obviously uh, uh, by looking at, at, at this list and, and, and talking this through throughout the all season, you are higher on, on Matt Corral yeah. than I am. Yeah, I got a first round grade on him. My comp was uh, Derek Carr. I couldn't find a, a perfect one to one comp. I think Carr is a bit better arm overall, but to me, Corral could be like a top ten quarterback. He's never going to be an elite, elite guy. Like I think Willis, if all things break right for him, could be an elite, elite quarterback. I don't think Corral is, but I think he could be a top ten quarterback, very similar to Derek Carr. Okay, and 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 Ritter, I'm I'm not high on Ritter, but. Y- you're really not high on Ritter. Yeah. Well, let's go to Howell and pick it. I was kind of go through the list and then we'll get to Ritter last, but yeah, I, I did not come away. I thought I would like Ritter more than I, than I ultimately did, but Sam Howell, I know we just talked about him some 
Um, really good arm. Like if people don't talk about his arm enough. I know you talked about it a lot. He showed some great clips, the far hash throws, and just you know, the deep ball overall. The deep ball accuracy to me is really impressive, and um, just his toughness as a, as a runner um, was also impressive. So just what he did for that program, I thought was was all important. Uh, and we've talked about his mobility before, and hopefully he doesn't have to use it as much, uh, especially the way he 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 runs in the secondary. Uh, yeah, somebody needs to get him to the to to uh, PNC Park uh, with some of those guys and 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 learn the sliding uh, aspect of the game there because uh, I mean look he he can get you some yards scrambling and all but uh, I don't think he's going to run away from too many people when he tries to use his body too much too many times to 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 get those extra yards if you will there and uh, he did you know one of the one of the knocks on him that. Uh, there were times that I felt like he maybe should have stayed in the pocket instead of bailing on the pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, those kind of things. Now on, on the flip side, you, you see, I think the throw against Notre Dame in 2020, good job. I think he's got some, some pocket presence in there that might be a little underrated, uh, there. I, I, I think he has a good feel, uh, better feel than probably most give him credit for. When it comes to the pocket, those little subtle slides that allow him to be able to step into some deep throws. And there's one one specifically, I think, in that game against Notre Dame that shows that in 2020. I'll have to, did you show that one on your timeline? I'm guessing yes. you didn't trying to think, okay, what yes. that play was. I think this is the game where he ran over, like ran for a bunch of yards and was just trucking dudes as well. Like I think that was a Notre Dame game. There's, there was a, quite a few of them That's where he, uh, he, he, he took off with it. I'll see if I can send it to yeah. you here. It, it was almost tough to – get a feel for his pocket presence because it felt like he was under siege so much at North Carolina line felt like it was not very good, at least in 2021. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there. Um, he definitely had to put the team on his back last year because they lost you know, their top receivers or top running backs. And that line was not great. So my comp for him, um, and you're sending me the clip right now. Let me take a look at the clip here, actually, because I, I don't think I've seen this one quite yet. Uh, this was against Notre Dame in 20. 2020. Okay. Yeah, far hash throw. And I see the, the the pocket movement there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think I, I, obviously you know mobility and movement outside the pocket is really important. But I I think people still forget about and overlook the mobility within the pocket. That's still the most important thing to me. Sure you're doing is. that a lot more than you're doing that running around like you know backyard backyard football. That's what's allowed Tom Brady to do what he's yeah. done for so long. You know, for sure. Yeah. Um, so my comp to Hal, and I think I mentioned this one last week, was Jake Locker, and that's going to sound more negative than it's meant to be. It's just kind of more just style and how they kind of remind me of in terms of frame and just just overall play style. Not it's not necessarily like Locker's career, but I will say how will like Locker never learn to do? We'll have to avoid how to invite contact so often and take those shots, and because mm-hmm. it's a, there's an injury risk there. And I don't think Howell had the injury history that Locker did coming out of Washington, but. The NFL is going to be a different animal. And so they're kind of thickly built dudes with good arms and have to kind of learn when to pick their spots better. Just really good athletes overall. Locker was a great uh, baseball player drafted by the Angels. Howell could throw a 90 mile hour fastball. So um, just kind of similarities in terms of just style and, and frame and, and overall arm strength. Okay. So can you pick what, what fourth? Don't, what, 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 mm-hmm. uh, other than, you know, him, him needing to get down and, and learn how to slide and not take kind of those hits. What, what is one of the, one of the other bigger turnoffs for you with how I thought there is some work to do from an accuracy standpoint. The deep ball is good, but short intermediate accuracy on some of the RPOs, middle of the field type throws need to be better in terms of just placement, overall accuracy, allowing for run after catch type of stuff. He did just, he did want to take off and run too often last year. So just overall going through progressions and he, he can make the full field read occasionally, but he was quick to pull the ball last year. I think he was again, trying to do, do a bit too much. It was a shotgun based offense. Most of these quarterbacks were, but he'll have to learn how to work under center some as well. And then just, and I mentioned, this as well last week and this is kind of a controversial opinion but i he's a quiet guy and i get that leadership will look and in, in, in come in different forms and you don't have to always yell and scream to, to be a good leader but i like my quarterback to have a little bit of fire and a little bit of, of vocalness to the game and how i think and i, I think he, he's been asked about this by teams he said you know he's not going to be that super rah-rah you know sp- this is sparta kind of guy and i think there's value in a quarterback that can kind of approach things in that sense okay so Kenny Pickett, number four, and I'm sure a lot of Pitt fans are mad at me for putting Pickett. Because usually, usually people go Willis one, Pickett two. I want Pickett four. I do think he's he's How pretty much. How dare you treat Dan Marino <laughs> Jr. like yeah. that? 
uh, NFL ready in terms of just, you know, from a football IQ standpoint, from a system standpoint, he played the most, you know, NFL similar offense uh, in of all these quarterbacks that I've watched under Mark Whipple, a former NFL coach, Ben Roethlisberger's first quarterback coach, his accuracy to his right looks good. He's competitive. He's mobile enough. He had a you know great season in 2021, first 11 win year for for Pitts and Dan Marino led that team to I think 11 wins in 1981. Um, I thought what Clayton showed in the red zone third down study was really impressive, and Pickett's really shined in some of that situational football type stuff. So from that aspect, those are all things I like about Kenny Pickett. Okay. And I use the phrase he's a take a profit quarterback. Like he'll hit his check down, he'll hit his running back, go through his read. You saw that with him more than probably any other quarterback in this class. Now, what I don't like is just the lack of the physical trait, the standout trait. What is the best part of his game overall? I had issue with that, but well, I know that's the common knock on Pickett, the lack of elite physical tools. I thought there were some other intangible things in his game that also worried me. Um, his overall pocket presence, he likes to drift in the pocket and, and, and get depth and kind of start falling backwards at the top of his drop when you don't have a big arm overall and you're kind of falling backward, that's going to become even tougher on you. And then it's less of a hand size issue because everyone talks about the hand size, eight and a half inches with Pickett. But I thought an overall carriage of the football needs a lot of work. This guy apparently had 38 total fumbles in college, lost 26 of them. And it was less about him having small hands, but about whenever he looks to run and take off, that ball drops on his hip away from his body. It's really loose and begins to swing. And I have a couple of screenshots I'll show it's not in the article, but I'll show at some point of, of him fumbling because that ball is loose and away from his hip. I don't care if you have eight and a half inch hands or 10 inch hands. If you have that football low and away and swinging and you got a 270 pound defensive lineman swatting at your hand, you're going to fumble the football. So he's got to really learn to, to carriage the football, take better care of the football in the pocket, or he's going to be a real big fumble risk in the NFL the way that he was in college. Uh, when you think back to senior bowl and obviously corral wasn't there, mm -hmm. uh, do you, do you remember where you started off, uh, initial thoughts with some of these guys and, 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 uh, has, has, has any shifted, uh, you know, what kind of pre-built bias did you maybe have going in, into this, uh, into the senior bowl with these guys and, you know, tell you. Has, has anything moved since, since, since senior ball? Well, going into the senior ball, I didn't have really a lot of thoughts on the guys in general because I hadn't really watched most of them. I don't, I don't watch a ton of college football during the season. I'd watch a little bit of pit, obviously, but um, I didn't really have a lot of thoughts. During the senior ball, I thought Willis had a good week, not quite as good as everyone said it was. I thought Ritter had a good week, so I guess I've kind of changed on Ritter a bit since uh, you know post-senior ball. And the thoughts on the other guys probably haven't changed a whole lot, but I didn't have really any thoughts going into the senior bowl because I just hadn't evaluated them too much. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm um, sure that's getting a lot of comments today. Is it not? Yeah. And my comp for Pickett is Jared Goff. Um, I don't know. I, I couldn't find the, the, the best comp, but I just kind of some similarities there in terms of like needing a really good supporting cast around them. Jimmy Garoppolo kind of another comparison to a, uh, to Kenny Pickett, then finally Desmond Ritter, and this is one that uh, Bear, I, I was not allowed not allowed to go to the Bearcats uh, campus, I'm sure, because Ritter. Let me let me start with the good on Ritter, and I think I mentioned this last week as well. Is that he turned that entire Bearcats program around? I mean, they were a four win team year before he got their first year with him starting. They won 11 games. They go to the college football playoffs. They nearly beat. Georgia in 2020 lost on a last second 53 yard field goal. Um, so you got to give him a lot of credit for what he did for that school. He's a good touch throwing. He's going to take air out of the football. He's got you know mobility. He did work a little bit under center, uh, four year starter. All those things are, are are really you know positive things in his direction. In terms of what I don't like, it's partly the physical tools. You know his arm strength overall is average, maybe even a bit below average. But I thought his accuracy to me was the most alarming part of his game. And maybe the lack of arm strength is kind of part and parcel of that. Cause whenever he tries to throw outside the numbers and make some of those, you know, deeper throws, he's got to push the football more. And his accuracy to me was a lot spottier. There was a lot more um, inconsistency in his game than there should be for a four year starter. And although he's tall, he had a bunch of bad passes for in the Alabama game this past year. He's mobile. He's a good athlete with good speed, but not a super dynamic runner overall. And I just, to me, when you have an average arm and spotty accuracy, that's a tough combination for me to to, to really get excited about. Now, look, uh, uh, you know, 
we're careful of separating what we think the Steelers will do versus what we would do, because quite honestly, it doesn't matter what we would do as much as people, we appreciate people saying, well, uh, we appreciate, we, we, we appreciate your insight and your thoughts on, okay, uh, that that's fine. I, I get it, I guess, but let's, let's, let's throw this out there, Alex. Uh, let's say all five quarterbacks for some reason, were still on the board at 20. Okay, at 20. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a huge, obviously, that's a hypothetical, unlikely to come true. Uh, in short, which which one would you bang the table for? And, and let's even uh, uh, extrapolate it out some. If you were to trade up for one quarterback, uh, who would it be? And let's use that as a scenario. And number two, who would you bang the table for at number 20, assuming that player uh, were to fall that far and you didn't have to trade up for him? Well, I just go back to my list. I mean, my list is my list at this point. So right. Malik Willis is my top quarterback. So if they're all there, he's my guy. If you're going to trade up for anybody, he has the, the highest grade. Corral had a low end first round grade. Willis was more middle of the pack first round grade. And so if you're going to trade up for anybody, to me, it would be him. Uh, Willis Corral, the two guys I have the first rounders on. Willis is the top quarterback by a, Fairly significant margin, 8.9 grade on him. Corral has an 8.6 grade. Howell, 8.4. Pickett, 8.2. Ritter, 7.9. Um, so based off of that, if they're all there, if I can go get a guy, it's Malik Willis. Would you trade up for Corral? Well, you get into what you said about, like, if you love a guy, then why not go trade up for him? What would be the reason not to? Um, do, you, do you love him enough to – and that's a delicate question, I know, because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah. But – would you trade up, uh, you know, to, I don't know, let's, let's say, let, let's say the 10 spot. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'll have to, but to answer the question directly, yes. I think I'm excited okay. enough about Matt Corral to, to be willing to move up for him. What I have to do it, it would depend on, you know, depending on how I think the draft's going to go. Um, if I don't have to trade up, I'm not going to overall, but if I'm concerned, I can't get the guy, um, then, then, then I would be willing to make a move for Matt Corral. Yes. All right. Uh, I just, it feels like the Steelers are, have a list that whoever falls to 20 is going, they're going to just check them off like a yeah. fantasy football magazine, you know? <laughs> like a grocery list. Yeah. yeah. Got bread, bread, eggs. All right. You're, you're the milk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, so the, does the it feel are... like that to you or no? Or, or do you think they, uh, it's so hard. I mean, it's so hard to, 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 to get a gauge on, on. And look, they, they might try to go up and fail to do so. We might never know how hard they tried. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's another aspect of it here. My thought on this, and I, I, I will never change from this, as, uh, right, right, especially when it comes to this class specifically, is, you know, if, if Malik Willis is your guy, you better go get him. You know, right now, some of say, well, what what if this was the 2004 class? Well, 2004A was... 17 years ago right 18 years ago mm-hmm. and uh man and, and the Steelers pick you know a lot higher up at that time and there was a lot of talk at, at that time of you know man one any any one of those three quarterbacks you'll be fine with you know uh uh, uh kind of thing there so i i don't i don't i always look at just the individual year uh overall but i i've, I've never felt more that there's it's Malik Willis and then the rest of his class. Yeah, I get that. Um, if they don't draft a quarterback, then they, Colbert might say that they tried to trade up for one of the draft a quarterback. They're going to be like, well, we tried to trade up for another guy. We couldn't get him. So we drafted whoever we drafted. Um, or no, the way he'll frame is he's a guy that we wanted. You know. Yeah, that's how they'll frame it for sure. I, I, I think obviously they're smart enough to not just literally be checking a list. They, it just, you know, what, what's their grade going to be? What if they love a guy and we don't, we don't know if that's true or not. If they draft him, they're going to say they love him, and we'll have to kind of just sure, take that well, at face we'll have value. Sure, we'll have to take that, but I'm not going to believe them. <laughs> okay, well, well, then, then there you go. Um, so no, yeah, I, 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 I do keep know. going back to the aspect though, too, uh, uh, that you, you, you've uh, said uh, once or twice that. Yeah, I really think Mike Tomlin really likes Malik Willis, and it, it does sort of just feel like throughout the, the process of traveling, at least, that Colbert might be more inclined to, to have Howell be his guy. Mm-hmm. That's what I was going to bring up because the, the more relevant and important question is, what do the Steelers think? And I think, and we know one knows, this is all just us guessing, but I think Willis is going to be the, the number one quarterback on their board. Who's number two? 
and I wrestled and I'm still thinking about this. So I'm kind of talking out loud here and, and I'll get your thoughts. Um, I wrestled between two guys as their number two, and maybe I'm a little biased here. So pick this it, is kind of my rankings. Howl. No, I, I think Corral and Howell. And I say, okay. and I know Corral is going to be an underrated name here. And I say that because Kevin Colbert a couple weeks ago or months ago was asked, what is the most important trait to you with a quarterback? And he accuracy. said accuracy. And, and I, you could debate this, but I think Corral is the most accurate passer in this class. Okay. And so to me, I think that's, and he's got the mobility, like the toughness they're going to love. They love the, they love the guys. First of all, they love the bowl game guys, right? They, 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 they draft the guys that have not played in their bowl game. I mean, I don't know if they have. Right or wrong, I think they like the guys who compete, and that's going to be important with Corral playing and then getting hurt in that in that bowl game this past year. Um, and I think he's a really good fit for Matt Canada in terms of the yak throws, rack throws. No quarterback had more yards off of play action last year than Matt Corral in college football. And I think Matt Canada wants to get back to some play action roots for his offense. Okay. So maybe I'm biased because Corral and Howell, my number two quarter, number two, number three quarterbacks, but. Um, and then I'll, I mean, they could draft pick. They could they could draft any of these guys, and it would not shock me given the interest they've shown in all five of these guys. But I think Willis is one, and I am debating. I, I've had in my head how is number two for them, but I'm also thinking about Corral because I think he's a really good fit for what Pittsburgh looks for and wants to do on offense. How many of these do you think will go in the first round? Period three, or do you think? Yeah, if, <sighs> if somebody goes back into the but you know. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a it's hard to imagine in the top 20 picks of there being more than three period in the top and, 20 alone. Yeah, I think. That's yeah. Fair. Uh, now, beyond that, I guess it all depends on if any teams want to probably go back up you know, into the round or something like that. And it's it feels like only three is going to be drafted in the first round. At least that would be my guess as I sit here right now. Yeah, I think threes, three is the over under is a good number to put on it, or three and a half, or whatever you want to say. Um, I think threes. A Who fair would number. you be most surprised other than Pickett? And oh, it's a slam dunk. Pickett, Pickett, and Willis are going in the first round, right? Is that? And then does the question becomes if any of those other guys go in the first then? I guess what I'm asking is who would be the most surprising to see not get picked in the first round? To not get well, Willis. I think Willis is a lock. Um, I think Pickett has a, the next best odds to go. What does Carolina do at six is the question. That's when the draft starts for Pittsburgh. It's like pick five with the yeah, Giants. Do you want to re- leave Carolina? I and then really six. think they're going Pickett. I've pick felt it. that way yeah. for a while now. But What if they don't take a quarterback at all? That'd be mm, interesting. That would be interesting. Um. And what does Atlanta do? What, what's Atlanta going to do? Yeah. You know? And then Seattle at nine and the Saints. And they just signed Jameis. But do they want to get a long term option? Washington. Are they just traded for Wentz? But do they really feel like Wentz is their guy for the next couple of years? Probably. But who knows? I, to answer, I, I don't have a great answer for your question, I suppose. I think Willis is a lock to go at round one. I think Pickett has a good chance to go. The rest are kind of becoming more open ended after that. I think three quarterbacks probably ultimately go in the first round, but I really don't know because it's okay. such an unpredictable position and, and position to be in. It, it's a, it's a tough Especially class. With this class. Yeah, yeah, this class. Yeah. This class is just, it's a mess. And then last, I mean, you did more work than I did on last year's class. A lot more work. Yeah. Um, and we're with that being said, I mean, and look, look you were higher on most, I think uh, on, on Mac Jones. Mm-hmm. And, I was a big uh, Mac Jones. Fan. And that, that, that ends up, feeling like it was the uh at least initially on one season feels like a right 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 decision there would any of these guys push back jones and uh, uh you know as far as mm-hmm. your evaluations yeah i know our grading system's new and so hopefully down the road we can use this grading system to better compare guys um because i don't have a, a, an actual number numerical grade on mac jones i would probably in my head i would probably would have mac jones as the jones? second I'd probably have him as the second best quarterback in this class, only behind Willis, just given Willis's potential upside and traits there. So I'd probably go Willis one, Mac Jones two. Okay. If I had to, and that probably last year was probably like the third or fourth best quarterback, you know, behind right. uh, Lawrence and, and those guys. So that's what's in my head. All right. All right. So that's my top five quarterback rankings. Good Again, job. just my own rankings. Thank you. Um, I'm sure they'll be wrong. I'm sure people will, I'm sure people are already angry about them. I haven't posted it on Twitter yet. I'm sure I'll do that. And it's going to be just the mess of my timeline the rest of the day. So, Looking forward to people yelling at me and calling me stupid. So that's, oh, that's a good way to start my go. Monday. There you go. All right, Dave. Anything else you're going to talk about? Anything else we did not cover you wanted to address? I think we got most of it, didn't we? Uh, 
uh, well, one other thing about Pierre Strong. Yes, uh, uh, he's he's got to hold on to the football a little bit better. Had a little bit of a fumble mm-hmm. issue there, so that that's something to keep in the back of your mind there. For sure, good point. All right, Dave, let's get to reader reader emos and close out today's show. All right. Let me where are my glasses at here. <laughs> and just a reminder, Dave and I will have a live stream tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time Monday on my YouTube channel. So you can come out and hang with hang out with us and yell at me about my quarterback rankings. Uh, let's see here. Chuck Griffith. Uh, it seems that NFL defenses are trending toward two high safety looks. Do you think that the Steelers will follow this trend or stay with the free safety, uh, uh, strong safety, traditional looks uh, for the list of safeties below if the Steelers selected them? Just quick thoughts on uh, would that signal more too high or traditional free safety slash strong safety and which one be be best fit alongside me? Uh, he's got the list here of Daxton Hill, uh, Lewis uh, Sign, uh, Jaquan Brisker, Jalen Petrie, and he has highly unlikely, but Kyle Hamilton. So thoughts on two safety looks around the NFL and from the list, uh, which one would probably be a best fit alongside Mika? Yeah, uh, two highs becoming more and more in vogue. A lot of teams did that to try to slow down the Chiefs last season, gave them some some problems. Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers on Pittsburgh and too high, but I think they used some more too high last year on third down, a lot of cover two, two-man type of stuff. I think the cover two rate was one of the higher numbers in football, like top 10-ish, I want to say, in football. Um, so I think you saw their numbers come up a little bit as well. Um, and then last year they played, they probably got away from some of that because they needed to stop the run. They put an eighth man in the box uh, quite a bit in terms of the best fit to Minka. I mean, I think anyone, you know, could potentially play with Minka. I think sign, I think you're looking for that, that box safety type of guy. Cause Minka is not that kind of guy. So I think Lewis sign Jaquan Briscoe would work well. How about Hill from Michigan? Daxton Hill is a guy we don't talk about much, but maybe we should give a little bit more love to because he kind of checks those boxes. Right. I haven't watched enough on him to be honest with you. So maybe that's somebody this week that I focus a little bit more on is Daxton Hill. I know we got a profile up on the site and all like mm-hmm. that, but I, I, I need to put more eyes on some of Dang. his, his tape overall. I've seen a lot of uh, look, I mean, how could you not use uh, so many Georgia games on, on saw a lot of Lewis sign already. And they really like Jaquan Brisker, man. I, I'm going to tell you that right now. I think that's pretty epic. Evident. I think just looking at his tape alone, uh, as far as where he's probably going to come off the board, which is probably in the second round around that number, you know, 50, 50 ish uh, uh, category there. Uh, that's the guy I think that's easily easier to draw a line to because of how he plays and where he's going to go in this draft and his, his, his potential fit and see his defense there. Uh, I think Lewis signs one of those guys that you either have to take him in the first round, or probably not going to be there in the second. The same might go for Daxton Hill as well, too. Obviously, Kyle Hampton, uh, you would think it's going to be off the board by the time, 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 time to see this pick as well, too. Yeah. But Kevin Colbert did show up at Notre Dame Pro, Pro Day. So, uh, for what we think he did, I'm yeah, still not we, sure. That's true. At least we think he did. And Petrie is the guy that you've linked uh, to if they don't grab one of these guys. Uh, you know, Hill, uh, Lucene, uh, uh, Brisker, or, or, or Kyle Hamilton. That you, I guess, if you got around what three or round three or four, that that Jalen Petrie could be be the guy you look for. Man, I think Petrie's going to go higher than people think. I think he could honestly be like an early an early day two kind of guy. Uh-huh. I mean, just if he checks every box: athleticism, smarts, good system, scheme, good coaching, physical, can cover. I think he's, I think safeties are going to go higher than people think. All right, true or false? One of these five safeties that Chuck Griffith has here: Hill, Lewisine, Brisker, Petrie, or Hamilton will be a Pittsburgh Steeler. Ooh, that's so tough. Um, I, I I really don't know how to best answer that. I guess if, if do they trade up for a quarterback? How much how much draft capital do they have to work with here? Is kind of the question. I'll, I'll say. I'll say true with Brisker because I'm kind of zeroing in on him the way that you are, but let's see what happens round one. I say true as well, too. They're going to come out with one of these guys. I Could think. Hamilton fall? Could Kyle Hamilton? There's been some. I don't know. You're, you're, uh, seven, your boy, 40. you know what? We we need uh, your boy Cross out of Maryland. Oh, Nick Cross. Yeah, Nick Cross. I'm thinking Charles Probably Cross needs, for some reason. Needs to be added to this list. Yeah. Uh, Pittsburgh loves their Sparky safeties or Rassy. I don't know how to. I like Sparky better than saying Rassy, but athletic safeties. Right. Say I interrupt you. Say what you're gonna say. I, no, I was just saying that Pittsburgh likes their sparky safeties, and the cross fits that that mold well. Yeah, but before that, before I, before I was saying, could, could Kyle Hamilton fall to, to Pittsburgh? Went in the four seven reportedly. Some rumors about his stock is quote unquote dropping. I don't know. Is he the uh, 
Jarvis Jones. <laughs> oh, don't put that, that curse uh, on him. Uh, 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 the safeties? Uh, I don't know. Safeties tend to fall. I mean, it's not they a position do. that goes you know, typically high. So, I mean, there's some rumors that he's going to come outside the top 10. I, I love the guy's tape. So, I mean, if he's there at 20, it's I don't hard, know, man. It's hard to ignore. Yep. We'll see. All right. Uh, Caleb writes in. Hello, fellas. Thank you for everything you, everything you do. I enjoy the show weekly. If Willis and Pickett are gone by 20, we don't trade up to either. Who would you and or the Steelers pick at 20 based off of need, even though I know the Steelers rarely uh, base a pick off need. Dave, you first. Sorry, Alex. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't know what it's significant. I mean, look, you got to give me the first 19. Tell me who the 19 are, are, are off the board, right? Uh I, as Alex and I said earlier in the show, I'm going to be quite stunned if the Steelers come out of the first round without a quarterback. So I would say, based on your scenario here, Caleb, if Willis and Pickett are gone by 20, we don't trade up for either who would you or the Steelers pick at 20, blah, blah, blah. I would probably go Sam Howell. Okay. I would go Matt Corral. He's my number two quarterback in my rankings. So that's the guy that I would go with if Willis and if Pickett was there, I'd still go uh, Matt Corral. Who will the Steelers take? Like I said, to me, I'm debating between Howell or Corral in my head right now. Uh, Blake Literal writes in, uh, fan podcast question. Uh, can Yens pretend for like 30 seconds that Colbert and Tomlin went to the Ohio State Pro Day? <laughs> he says, I'm in love with Olave, Chris Olave. I just want to pretend it's still possible. Then gra- grab Stroud next year and I can live in my fantasy land. Thank you, Blake Literal. Uh, Blake, I... We can't, I don't have the ability to uh, uh, all of a sudden make Colbert and Tomlin appear at that Ohio State Pro Day for you. I assume this was sent in by Kim Hayward, just trying to get all the Ohio State yeah. guys. Uh, this is the pseudo name, uh, Blake. Is uh, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to say that there's no chance. I mean, they're not obligated to draft somebody who they only attended their pro day of, but the history there is the history. I'm not going to bore you with all the details again. So, We'll pretend though for 30 seconds and, and say that that could happen. <laughs> uh, Brian writes in maybe an oddball question, but if Steelers were to draft Sam Howell, that would give them two quarter. Uh, we hit you this, read this one. Okay. Yeah. He's still right. not looked up multiple guys from the same school. Right. Again, I'm sure it's happened at some point. Okay. Uh, all right. That's got it for today, Alex. And uh, tell everybody what we're doing tonight. Yeah. I have a live stream tonight, 7 PM Eastern time. Dave and I, on my YouTube channel, just search Alex Kazora, and you can come out and hang out with Dave and I, and uh, we'll answer as many Steelers questions as possible. I don't know. We might be uh, – are we going to keep three podcasts all off season here? I don't know. It feels like it with the way this really? news cycle has gone. I mean, maybe we'll slow down post-draft, but we'll probably be chugging along – until the draft, I'm guessing at three. Uh, at least, at least until the draft, I would think. So uh, yep. we will be back on Wednesday. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow follow Alex on Twitter and uh, 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 make sure you ate enough bran uh, uh, today because you'll probably <laughs> need it to uh, throw some of it at, at at Alex and his list. But uh, no, in all seriousness, try to get by SteedersDepot.com and and read over the article, uh, the rankings that uh, Alex has on his quarterback rankings. There would be much appreciated. Follow him on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, uh, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigation bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button uh, as well. We appreciate all the support, all the emails that we get. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, make sure you uh, drop by the live stream uh, seven o'clock Eastern time tonight. Uh, 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 Go to YouTube and search Alex Kazora on that. And we'll be answering as many questions as we can within an hour's time on that. So uh, until either then or on Wednesday, as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.